So a recent story posted by Andrew Stanton from Newsweek discussed a recent situation developing where the Supreme Court gets a January 6th defendant out of jail. Now, in the article, Stanton writes that a man convicted of charges related to the January 6, 2021 riot at the U.S. Capitol is getting out of jail early due to the Supreme Court taking up a case that may affect the sentences of hundreds of defendants. Kevin Seafried, a man from Laurel, Delaware, was sentenced to three years in prison for a felony conviction of obstruction of, of an official proceeding as well as 12 months and six months for misdemeanor charges. The Department of Justice said that Seafried, as well as his son Hunter, were among the first to enter the Capitol and were photographed carrying a Confederate flag while inside. Now, that obstruction charge is at the center of a case picked up by the Supreme Court. And in this case, Fisker v. United States challenges the Department of Justice's use of the obstruction of an official proceeding charge, which has been used against January 6th defendants for allegedly disrupting the Electoral College certification. After the Supreme Court agreed to hear arguments in the case, some defendants filed for release pending the final ruling. On Tuesday, Judge Trevor McFadden ruled that Seafried can be released from his prison sentence awaiting the court's decision. So essentially, the excuse the government used to jail hundreds of people who many did nothing more than trespass, which, by the way, normally would just be a misdemeanor carrying up to a maximum of six months in prison, found themselves instead facing years behind bars. The case of Fisker v. United States is taking on this Orwellian tactic that the Department of Justice has used to crush these protesters and is challenging the obstruction of official proceeding charge. Now, Judge Trevor McFadden ruled that Seafried could be released from his prison sentence while awaiting the court's decision. McFadden's determination was based on his assessment that Seafried does not pose a flight risk or a danger to the community. Likely, Judge McFadden was uh, was also noting to have observed that if the Supreme Court rules in favor of Fisker, Uh, It would likely mean that the defendant, Seafried's conduct, did not violate the obstruction law, leaving him to serve only his lighter sentences for the misdemeanor convictions. So basically letting him out of jail now seems uh, like the right thing if he if the Supreme Court overturns it. That way he won't serve additional time uh, that he otherwise would not be um, eligible for. Anyway, what this all means is if the Supreme Court rules in his favor, he'd be done with any future jail time and be a free man. Now, federal prosecutors have tried intimidating anyone who is looking to appeal their convictions. They are doing this by warning that anyone who appeals based on this Fisker case could have unintended consequences. Of course, right? U.S. Attorney Matthew Graves, for example, is cautioning that if the Supreme Court does side with Fisker, the government might seek consecutive rather than concurrent sentences for defendants' misdemeanor charges, potentially not resulting in shorter sentences. Now, now what this means is, what this guy is threatening people that, that, that are in jail right now who are looking to maybe appeal, is that if they appeal, instead of, say, let's say you have five two-year sentences that you're being charged with, just random number, right? And they're being done concurrently, meaning um, each two-year sentence has been done at the same time, so you're only in jail for two years. If they're not concurrent and they're consecutive, you're looking at 10 years in jail. So, and, and why this matters is most of the people, if not all, that are currently under the boot of the federal government right now with convictions for the J6 incident are serving their different sentences all at once rather than one sentence. So basically, this prosecutor is trying to frighten people into just accepting the federal government's effort in destroying their lives. It's an intimidation tactic, pure and simple. Um, And frankly, I find it insidious uh, that they're doing this. Now, the judge, though, Trevor McFadden, did criticize the prosecutors for relying on speculative claims that the court would convert Seafried's concurrent sentences to consecutive ones without the felony conviction. So at least there's that. So let's take a step back here and What is exactly is the Fisker v. United States? Well, the Fisker v. United States case revolves around the interpretation and application of 18 U.S.C. 1512c, a statute that prohibits obstruction of congressional inquiries and investigations. Specifically, the case addresses whether the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit erred in construing the statute to include acts unrelated to investigations and evidence. The government was trying to send a message, it seems to me, that basically you you get in our way and we'll crush you. Uh, never mind that the Department of Justice has looked the other way during the massive hate group riots from the likes of Antifa and BLM. This is during the George Floyd era, where literal cities burned 
uh, and people were murdered. There was a lot of violence. But these January Sixers, well, they're the worst human beings alive because instead of terrorizing the average American citizen, they were in Washington, D.C. And of course, Washington, D.C. is the sacred cow that, oh, no, you can't you can't you know scare us. We're the elites. You know, f the American people, us, we're the ones you can't touch. Right. So these J6ers, worst human beings alive, must be destroyed. Now, the legal debate here is centering on whether the actions of Fisker and similar defendants can be considered as obstructing an official proceeding under this 1512C, particularly focusing on the scope of what constitutes obstruction in the context of the Capitol riot. Now, initially, the court district dismissed the obstruction charge against Fisker, interpreting the law as intended to apply only to evidence tampering that obstructs an official proceeding. However, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia said, hell no, we're not doing that, and reversed this decision, ruling that the statute applies to all forms of corrupt obstruction of an official proceeding beyond just evidence tampering. Now, the potential outcome of the Fisker versus United States case could significantly impact the legal landscape surrounding the January 6, 2021 Capitol riot, including the prosecution of hundreds of defendants and possibly affecting high profile cases such as those against former President Donald Trump. A ruling in favor of Fisker, for example, could lead to a narrower interpretation of 1512C, potentially invalidating the use of this charge against many of the January 6 defendants. This could result in the overturning of convictions or the dismissal of charges for those accused or convicted under the statute, based on the argument that their actions do not meet the revised criteria for obstruction. Now, let's take a, a, an individual how this could change uh, the, their landscape. Donald Trump, for example. A favorable ruling for Fisker could directly impact his legal challenges, as he faces similar charges, among others. Two of the four counts that Trump is facing could be upended if the Supreme Court rules in favor of Fisker affecting one of the four criminal prosecutions against him. The Supreme Court's decision here could also influence the broader application of the obstruction charge beyond the January 6 cases. If the court adopts a narrow interpretation of 1512C, it could limit the Department of Justice's ability to prosecute cases involving obstruction of official proceedings under this statute in the future. Now, all of this, my friends, is deeply concerning. The multi-tiered justice in America has never been so apparent in our modern times. While, while the mostly peaceful protests of January 6th to steal a term that defenders of the hate groups Antifa and BLM used to excuse the most dangerous and expensive riot in American history. Uh, I'll give you an example of this, okay? So Antifa, BLM, the George Floyd riots, right? According to Axios, the property damage resulting from their arson, vandalism, and looting during the civil unrest back in 2020, is estimated to have incurred up to $2 billion of paid insurance claims. This figure set a new record compared to previous instances of civil disorder in the United States, eclipsing the highest inflation-adjusted totals for the 1992 Los Angeles riots, which were previously the most costly in terms of insured losses. And by the way, it wasn't just the insured cost that we can track— the Foundation for Economic Education points out that the true cost is likely even higher when considering uninsured losses. The long-term economic impact on affected communities and the broader societal costs uh, are much greater, and we don't have a way to accurately track them. And of course, there was the murder, mayhem, and terror by these hate groups. Um, the estimated number of people involved in these massive riots was somewhere between 15 and 26 million people in the U.S. And for comparison, the J6 protest and riot in total involved around 120,000 people. So with the BLM riots, 15 to 26 million people involved, $2 billion in damage. The January 6 riot, somewhere, I think, if I remember correctly, it's somewhere between $1.5 or $15 million. Uh, I can't remember off the top of my head, but it's somewhere around there. So infinitesimally smaller than the BLM riots, which, ha which happened only a few months prior. Now, in the case of the J6 riot, again, th this is going to showcase the difference in the way the federal government went after these people. You had 730 people that pleaded guilty to charges related to the January 6th Capitol riot. And many, by the way, if not most, were under duress. Now, what makes me say that? Well, uh, many of these instances that where people ended up pleading a guilty, they were stuck in jail for well over a year waiting for a trial date. Basically, you're stuck in limbo. 
Um, you're not getting your 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 uh, right for a speedy trial. And the government, well, big daddy government, you can't out alpha the state. So you're just stuck. What are you going to do? Spend the rest of your life waiting for a trial in who knows what you're being threatened with? I mean, what better way to break an average person's will than to violate their rights for a speedy trial and keep them locked away? Now, aside from those 730 that would eventually plead guilty, we have another 170 that have been convicted at trial by a judge or jury. And this would then bring the total number of convictions to about 900. All right. That's for 120,000 people total, those that were rioting and, the, and those that were just protesting. OK. Meanwhile, if we look at the George Floyd hate group BLM and Antifa riots out of the 15 to 26 million people out there, either protesting or rioting, burning down buildings, killing people, we have a paltry 300 people who were even charged with crimes related to this overwhelmingly massive riots. Worse still, the majority of these cases were dismissed. You have a significant portion, portion of the charges against the protesters, particularly those related to George Floyd demonstrations, were ultimately dropped, dismissed, or just not even filed. For example, in jurisdictions examined by The Guardian, at least 90% of cases were dropped or dismissed in some cities, with Dallas and Philadelphia seeing as many as 95% of their citations dropped or just not prosecuted altogether. Then there were deferred resolution agreements. So on top of all of this, in Portland, Oregon, about 60 of the 100 cases resulted in deferred resolution agreements under which charges could be dropped after a certain period of time if the defendants remained out of trouble. Because of why not, right? Then there were the federal charges. Now, the Department of Justice did announce that more than 300 individuals in 29 states and Washington, D.C. had been charged for the crimes committed adjacent to or under the guise of peaceful demonstration since the end of May. These charges range from attempted murder, arson, damaging federal property, to assaulting a law enforcement officer, etc. However, finding specifics on just how many were actually convicted and what their sentencing has been has been challenging for me to find. But I did find this from uh, the AP, although they don't provide any data or sources. They said that they found that more than 120 defendants across the United States pleaded guilty or were convicted at trial of federal crimes, including rioting, arson, and conspiracy. So that's it. 120 people were convicted federally. But you have 900 with a J6 riot. Seems super fair to me, right? The justice system, my friends, has long since been compromised and is in desperate need of reform. We live in a day and age where one's political leanings here in the U.S. seem to dictate what punishments for blatant crimes you might endure. Vote for the right party. Um, maybe have the right uh, sexuality, right, right gender, right race. Hey, your sins, my friends, may very well be forgiven. It's something that should never be allowed in this country. And yet here we are. It needs reform. But will it? Only time, my friends, will tell. And that, my friends, will bring our episode to a close once more. As always, my friends, thanks for watching. From the To Be Frank Show, I am Adrian, and I will see you all next time.